pain will be one of the last things when we inevitably go out flailing, wailing, fiery aftermath of some tragic but glorious incident. What exactly is pain? Though what is it? How does it work? Does it feel the same for you as it does for your a-hole neighbor? If you both hurt the same, isn't that a little bit unfair? Because he obviously deserves way more pain than you. If you have trouble coming up with answers to these questions, don't feel bad. Science can answer them. The eggheads that be who study pain all day long to researchers who design drugs to treat it and to the doctors who prescribe them to you, none of them can even agree on a single definition of what the heck pain actually is. Perhaps the best way to demonstrate, look at this fibromyalgia, which used to be called the big sucky baby whiner disease because it was made up. This medical condition best described as my ouch, everything hurts. There is no physical text to confirm whether you have it. There is no brain scan or blood test or spirit medium who can confirm this condition. So how can they diagnose it? Well, you fill out a questionnaire. Seriously. Do you have lots of unexplained pain in various random parts of your body that doctors can't figure out? Yes? Boom! Fibromyalgia. Or possibly demonic possession could be aliens, especially the greys. I don't know. But the FDA has approved drugs to treat fibromyalgia because they seem to help. No one knows why. Or even if it's an actual thing. We do not know if it's thing one or thing two or combination of the unspoken thing in between holding the things together. We have no idea. But this area of science fiction has come to life. Surely there's some kind of high-tech brain scan, special magic bead that can be used to determine if you're in pain. Indeed, doctors say there's differences in brain scans of people with fibromyalgia, but there's nothing consistent, not from patient to patient, or person to person, or city to city, or country to country of people who just have this disease. No doctor can peek inside your skull theater and even say that you have the condition. Actually, no doctor can tell how much pain you're in. Um, ever. Because we've only just recently taken the first tentative baby steps towards figuring out how to detect a pain in the first place. In a person's brain activity, of course. Now, according to an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience, and probable Star Wars character, his name is Tor Wagner. Yeah, I'm seeing him having a role in, in Star Wars. Anyway, right now, there is no clinically acceptable way to measure pain other than emotions, or actually other emotions, other than to ask a person, how do you feel? So, how are you feeling today? Aside from the general um, annoyance, at the incoherent uncertainty of medical science and your body and of course all of the universe we mean somewhere between oxycodone and I don't know we don't know <laughs> we don't know is it real we feel it right we know what ouch means what it is no idea anesthesia Another great mystery, believe it or not. It's truly a miracle of science. But it's more than a little scary, you know, when you think about it. Because with a few random chemicals, these wizards of modern science effectively shut down 
big chunks of your brain. Too much, and you're going to die and never wake up. Not enough, you are living the past life as a Civil War soldier on receiving the end of a hacksaw surgery. But why do these chemicals work? How do they interact with your body in such a way as to achieve a delicate balance? The next part is the scariest part. They don't have an effing clue. We cannot even lend them the money to buy a clue. No frickin' idea. In fact, reading a sentence counts as six credit hours in anesthesiology. Seriously. <laughs> so basically, anesthesia has evolved over the last couple hundred years, apparently. Although they did stuff before you, we found all these skulls with those holes in the head. You would think you would need something to pain killy for that, but you know they had cocaine. Anyway, medical professor saying, "Here, pump some of this into that guy. Let's see how it goes." Still screaming? Okay, try some of this. All that trial and error has pretty much given us a clear picture of what we can use to achieve desired effects, namely anything from complex steroids to straight lungfuls of exon gas. But as to why these substances dim your little consciousness without flipping it off altogether and appending deceased to your name there's no answer heck they don't even know the effect all the effects anyway on the same areas of the brain so we're just going to wing it I guess not a clue apparently they need to stimulate each area of the brain individually to get a better understanding go find a fondue fork somebody Scientists say that the brain does not feel. You cannot feel pain in your brain. Except the mass amount of chemical, biological, physical, um, electronical impulses seem to come from there. If pain is real, they should be able to touch certain parts of your brain and you feel it. If what they're saying is true and you don't feel it, pain is not real. And we are feeling something that we've been taught to feel. And then my infinite magic idea. That the only things that are happening to us are what we're doing to ourselves. And it's the main reason it's so hard to figure out how this actually alters our consciousness. It's that science doesn't know what consciousness is, how it works, and there's no definitive test to show whether someone is conscious even. The best anesthesiologists can do is look for a number of things, like the presence of certain brain waves, physical responses, and wait. Wait for um, sensitivity to pain. But as we've already discussed, science doesn't have a way to determine if you're in pain. So it's completely up to you to tell them if you're not quite um, anesthetized. I don't know. Enough. And if you get it wrong, don't worry. We'll have a few hours to think about how else you could have answered that while you're locked up inside your body mentally screaming as mass strangers cut you apart. No pressure though. Laughter. Some theorize it's a signal that a suspected threat doesn't actually pose a real danger. Some suppose it's a reaction to a result being different than what we expected. Others believe it's because Jim Carrey is talking with his butt again. And, you know, that's not normally how one speaks. 
they're all sorts. Well, they're at least all sort of kind of correct, right? Because nobody knows for certain why we laugh. We do know, however, that other emotional, well, that more than other emotional responses, laughter affects all kinds of freaking things in infamous unknown brain pan area again. And even motor sensations. And more surprisingly, though, the fact that most of our laughter isn't related to even comedy. Studies have shown that less than 20% of laughter happens as a result of something being funny. Far more often, we're laughing to punctuate some innocuous statement, to fill pauses in conversation, or because our elaborate evil plan is finally coming to fruition. You know, so the evil, wicked laugh, like, oh, <laughs> Like, why Why do you, in comics, what, <laughs> Alistair Crowley is probably behind that, too. What is the evil, wicked laugh for? <laughs> I don't know, but usually they're about to tell you um, what their wicked plan is, or try to kill you in some stupid, ridiculously elaborate way. But anyway, one thing we do, sort of, kind of, a little bit, No, is that laughter, well, where it started, it evolved from panting that primates do during hardcore tickle sessions. And they actually have it. This, of course, leads to the inevitable question, but why are we ticklish in the first place? Which leads to the inevitable answer, um... Yeah, we got nothing for that, too. We don't know why you're ticklish. We we don't have a clue. <laughs> okay. More mysteries. Barb's sister tried to kill her with tickling. Oh, my God. I have a, a cousin that tried to torture me to death with tickling. But apparently... You can't be ticklish because it makes no freaking sense. So stop laughing. It's not even funny. <laughs> One of the biggest science mysteries, too, about the human race. Why are we nice to each other? That's what they said. They think that's a mystery. I think it's because we are not. Naturally. You said phallus structure. <laughs> Insert bad word here. That the mother creates us that we have to learn hate and anger and fear. We have to be taught these things. So we are not naturally the big penis shaped hard stone thing. But, you know, how much sense does it make? Apparently, at one point, we were all hunter-gatherers when survival was all that mattered, right? So if you found a tiered layer cake sitting in the middle of the forest, sharing said cake with fellow humans would have run directly contrary to your own survival instincts. Well, first of all, it's sweet, said layered cake. No, I'm just giving an example. It could be anything we found out there. But if we found a sweet thing, immediately our immune systems would be knocked down. But we're not... You better get away from my cake. What? Anyway. That is my god darn cake. And I will bite the faces off all who seek to swipe its frosting with their thieving, nasty little fingers genuine selfless acts of kindness should have been straight up disinfectations. Those humans who looked out for number one should have survived past their jerkwad genes. Well, altruism should have been stamped out completely with other evolutionary dead ends like, I don't know, tails and gills and enjoying comic performances of Robert De Niro. 
So why did it even survive? Science says, drumroll, please, we got nothing. <laughs>